have everyone here that is able to make it out this morning. Folks may make their way in. Uh, I want to give a few announcements for you uh, before we kind of turn our hearts and minds towards worship. A um, couple things that are going on within the chapel community. First of all, on 8 March, which is this Tuesday, we're kicking off a few different studies, both of which I'm doing. One is our grief recovery uh, group. We're kind of doing a book study. Um, I'm in the midst of getting certified uh, uh, through this curriculum. Uh, but while we do that, we're going to be studying this book together. So um, this is really a program help, to help people um, recover from loss. And it's, it's, it's actually moving beyond anything, death, divorce, or other losses, including health, career, uh, and even your faith. And so uh, we have that group on Tuesdays at 1700, so pretty much at the end of the working day. If you'd like to join us, it'll be right here in the chapel uh, annex. Uh, getting to know each other and starting to go through that. So we kick that off on 8, 8 March, and we'll see how that group goes. Uh, and then on the evening of March 8th, on Tuesday, is our normal Bible study. Um, we'll be meeting uh, at 1900 in the Annex. Dinner is provided, uh, so you can choose to eat with us, or sometimes people eat before, uh, but we usually do kebabs or master's chicken. And uh, we'll be doing this curriculum, Relational Wisdom, and it's, uh, it's going beyond emotional intelligence, and, and uh, this is a great curriculum I teach on every base that I go to uh, because I always find it to be so practical, so helpful, so biblically robust in its truth. And it can be applied to your marriage relationships, your work relationships, your dating relationships, your friendships, uh, everything. And so it's a great, great uh, Bible study that we're doing at 1900. Very practical. I encourage you to join us for that. The other announcement that I'd like to give is on Easter Sunday, uh, we will be having a baptism services on that Sunday too. So I had one person said they would like to be baptized on that Sunday. If you put your trust and faith in Christ as your Lord and Savior, but have never followed him in believer's baptism, and uh, you feel uh, that that is something that you wanted to do, but you've just put off for some time, you can talk to me after the service, and uh, we can go through details on that, and you can be part of that service on Easter Sunday uh, to follow the Lord in baptism. And then uh, here is our last and probably one of our more important announcements. And I wish there was more of our regular attendees here this morning because they would want to hear this, but our seven churches sign up. So if you're interested in going on our seven churches tour, uh, that is to uh, Izmir, we pay for flight, we pay for hotel, and I believe we pay for around about 80% of the meals uh, for the trip are 100% paid for. Um, that sign up starts Monday. Uh, so it'll go out to the base. Typically, if we were doing this through our chapel tithes and offerings fund, then we could give you a couple days to sign up as an attender to the chapel services. But we're using appropriated funds for this. That means it will open up to the whole base on Monday. But if you're interested in going, uh, then I encourage you to email me, daniel.ruiz, that's R U I Z, dot 18, as soon as possible. Uh, and even I'd follow up with a walk-in on Monday. Emery Koshin is our local national. He's in charge of those sign-ups. These trips usually fill out with the, on the day that they are released. Uh, they will fill up really quickly. And some of the spots are pretty much beginning to be spoken for already. So uh, if you're interested in that, it is March 25th, 26th, and 27th. That's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we get back on base Sunday evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing upon our services uh, as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather and to worship you together. I pray that you be with uh, each part of the service, whether it's uh, the preaching of God's word, uh, the singing of songs, worshiping through giving, or the uh, observance of communion at the end of the service. God, I pray that uh, you would just bless each element. I pray that you will be lifted up. I pray that you will meet us in the midst of our needs, that you will speak to us, that we will draw near to you, that we will repent of the areas of our life that need repenting of, and we will follow you, our Lord and our Savior. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with me this morning as we sing songs to the Lord. Let's sing together.
5, 6 through 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety upon him, because he cares for you. And let's pray and ask God's blessing upon our giving this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you as you so richly given to us. I pray that we'll be faithful in worshiping you with our tithes and offerings. Uh, whether we give here uh, physically or we give electronically through the link or whether we give to our, maybe our churches back home. I know a lot of people do that. Uh, Lord, just bless our giving and, and help us not to be uh, controlled by money, but rather control money for good and to honor and glorify you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. I ask our ushers uh, to come at this time, our usher to come at this time and receive our offering. I want to give this announcement one more time um, before I get into the Word of God because we had a lot of people come in late. Uh, the Seven Churches trip, uh, sign up for it, drop Monday. Uh, because we're doing this through the certain line of funding that we're doing it, we have to open it up to the whole base. We, do, we can't give a certain amount of time for our congregations in the Protestant and Catholic community to sign up for that. So if you want to go on it, uh, you can give me your name and uh, your email and information after service or email me quickly at daniel.ruiz.18. And uh, Emery Koshin is our POC for that. That's the person that's gonna be handling the signups. So you probably wanna s follow up with Emery on Monday because uh, they do tend to fill up pretty much within 24 hours. It is a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, March 25th, 26th, and 27th. Airfare, hotel, and food is covered for the trip. And uh, so you maybe have to buy one or two meals on your own. Um, and it's the best hotel we could get. Uh, everything's very nice. It's a, it's a great job. The chapel does a great job putting these on. So if you're interested in that, you guys have the sneak preview. Okay, that's the best that I was allowed to do. Um, so please, uh, if you're interested, let me know immediately after the service. Otherwise, we're in the Word of God this morning. We'll be looking at a couple different verses. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7 will be the first text that we're in. It's kind of our foundational passage in this series about anxiety. You know, you heard me say this when we, the first series that I did when I arrived here. I talked about that our mind is really where the biggest battles, most of our biggest battles take place in our spiritual life, within our mind, within our heart. It's controlling our mind and directing the affections of our heart into the, into the direction of God and away from the things of this world where the spiritual life is really played out. Much is talked about when it comes to this area of anxiety uh, within the military because, uh, like I said last week, we tend to be, the profession of arms lends itself towards anxiety. You're anxious about who you're going to work with. You're anxious about whether you'll be deployed. We're always anxious about whether there's going to be some major war, some major conflict. Uh, we're drilling all the time, Right? Uh, you have other pressures that are put upon you in the military. I joke all the time, say, you know, in the, how, tell me that you're in the military without telling me you're in the military. And I say, you show up 15 minutes early for a meeting that starts 15 minutes late. Uh, that is kind of the, 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 the state of readiness that we are required to live in sometimes cultivates a real spirit of anxiety within our lives. And so it's pretty commonplace for me as a chaplain to sit down with uh, people, especially people that are new to the Air Force, and they're saying, hey, I didn't realize this, but I think I have some anxiety issues. I find myself having panic attacks and being filled with fear. You know, oftentimes we engage with people that look like they have it all together. They look strong on the outside, but on the inside they're weak and they're falling apart. 
They may look competent in public settings and in certain sector or cer certain uh, 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 settings of life. They may look confident, but in reality, they are filled uh, with fear. You might go to your phone and open up their social media and scroll through their IG or through their Facebook or whatever. If you're old, it's Facebook. If you're middle aged, it's IG. If you're really young, it's Snapchat and TikTok, right? Uh, I, don't, I don't even do those things. I'm too old for that. If I'm on Snapchat, it's creepy. If you're on Snapchat, it's normal, right? Uh, but uh, you go through someone's social media and they look like they are all healthy, happy, and wise, yet you find out that they are really hurting on the inside if you knew them personally. The reality is that many of us in the decision-saturated culture that we live in, the consumer-driven culture that we have to survive in, and the military culture that we all operate in are oftentimes in a state of anxiety where we feel overwhelmed by the decisions we have to make, the tasks that we have to do and the image that we are supposed to keep up. We might feel uncertain about who we are, what we believe, and where we're headed in life. We might feel like we are struggling to keep our head above water with the amount of, uh, of responsibilities that are hoisted upon us. We might just generally feel a constant pressure to perform. And through that, there comes just a spirit of angst, a heaviness that weighs us down, a panicked state of living where we might feel irritable. At times, we might feel downright depressed or discouraged. I don't know if you've ever had a big checklist and you get all the way, ding, 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 through your checklist to only look in your email and to realize your checklist has actually gotten longer than it was when you started and you feel a little discouraged. And dare I say that some of us sometimes have this underlying feeling inside our hearts and mind where we just don't look forward to tomorrow. When the alarm goes off, we want to pull the covers over our heads and just say, not today. Paul writes these words from prison can't imagine penning something like this, but it was through the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes to the church in Philippi, and I know we've repeated these verses over and over again. I'm hoping you memorize them by the time I get through with these two series that I've done since I've been here. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus the advice here is in every situation to respond to anxiety through prayer and petition and to take your requests unto God. We're going to look at these three portions of text this morning, every situation. Is it a sin, I ask you this morning, to feel anxious about some of the situations that you find yourself in? Is it, fear, is it a sin to be anxious about maybe the things that you're reading in the headlines in the news? Is it, feel, is it sin to be anxious about the stuff you've got to deal with in life or whatever you're personally going through? I would say, I'd propose to you that that anxiety as a feeling is not necessarily a sin. God doesn't want us to stay in it and dwell in it. He wants us to operate by faith. Uh, but feeling that way is not necessarily sin. What I would propose to you is that we go back and we think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Before his death on the cross uh, is kind of a, a, a picture of Christ himself being filled with this spirit of anxiety and was crushed with the dread of the death that was coming his way so much so that he prayed to the father let this cup pass from me 
He didn't want to be separated from the Father. He didn't want to see the, the Godhead to be fractured. He didn't want to go through the pain and suffering that he knew was just uh, about 24 hours away. And so, while we see him in a state of anxiety, we also see him do something. What does he do? He prays, doesn't he? He prays. See, my friend, anxiety is not necessarily a sin. It's a symptom. It is a signal in your life. Uh, I am a cheap person, generally. I don't like being in debt, so all the vehicles that I have bought my entire life have been used. And I always pay cash for the vehicles that I buy. Uh, I buy cars that have been depressing to drive, and I've been able to work myself up to buy in cash some cars that are not that embarrassing to drive. I don't know if I've ever told you the story about the 1998 Forest Green Chevy Astro van that I used to cruise around in Southern California in. Uh, I was a bad dude in that car. And I remember driving that car. Uh, we live near Palm Springs. Palm Springs like Las Vegas, Nevada. It gets super hot. And I'd have to drive, uh, this was when I was pastoring in California, I had to drive from my house down there about 30 minutes, and it was so hot that I'd have to, I had no air conditioning in my sweet ride that I paid $2,500 for. I had to take my shirt off and drive with my shirt off and the windows down because I'd be drenched in sweat by the time I got to work. And uh, speaking about a depressing moment in my life, I don't know if I've told you the story, one time I was driving down to 10, and I was depressed, me, go, go, do, do my dumb job, you know? And a guy in a, uh, like a Corvette or a BMW flew by me, like got behind me. I was in the fast lane, flashed his lights, got all impatient, flew by me, you know, laid on his horn. This beautiful black BMW. <laughs> you know, I could feel the wind enter my car. And as a grown man, I kid you not, I just started crying in my <laughs> forest green van as, I, as he flew by me because I felt like such a loser. Somebody, I told someone that story, and he asked me, what car do you have now? I said, a Jaguar, because <laughs> I couldn't live in that state anymore, so I bought a used Jaguar with cash. But um, it was, in, uh, uh, I don't know why I got onto that story, but I tell you, um, in that car, something always used to flash on the dashboard. It was a check engine light. Come on all the time, you know? We all have that on our cars. But the reality is that the light is not the problem, right? You're not trying to get that light to turn off. Sometimes I just wanted to disconnect the, bat the bulb so I didn't have the anxiety about the light on my dashboard. But the light was simply a signal that there was something worse with the vehicle and you needed to get it to somebody who knew how to diagnose and fix the problem within the car. And my friend, when you have the signal light of anxiety go off in your life, the problem is not the anxiety, it is the signal that you need to take your problems to the person who knows how to fix the issues. Anxiety is a signal alerting you that it is time to pray. It is time to pray. Paul's advice was to be anxious for nothing but in every situation to pray. And I can guarantee you this, my friend, this morning. If it is big enough to worry about, it is big enough to pray about. It, if it is big enough for you to spend time stressing about, thinking about, losing sleep over, sweating over thinking about dissecting and writing out all the different options that you have and all the scenarios that could go bad, whatever crazy stuff that you do when you begin to worry about stuff, I will tell you that it's big enough for you to pray about. And I will tell you that as a Christian, the first place that you ought to start in solving your problems is on your knees asking the Lord to assist you and give you wisdom as you diagnose the issues that you're facing in life. Cashed your cares upon God because God cares about you. If you're worried about your health situation, your doctor appointments, your future in the military, pray about it. If you're worried about the decisions that you need to make in life, about the, uh, uh, maybe about re-enlisting or, or getting out or retiring or financial decisions or whether you should marry someone or not marry someone, break up with someone or continue dating someone, pray about it. If you find yourself thinking about uh, anything in life, whether it's your 
expenses that you face or the clothes that you're going to wear, little things to big things, pray about it. It's big enough for you to worry about. It's big enough to pray about. And I can tell you this, that if it is on your mind, then it is on God's heart. If it's on your mind, it's on God's heart. God is not annoyed by you bringing things to him. He's just not. He's a loving father. You know, when Jesus left this earth, he said that he would send to us the comforter who will guide us into all truth. And that is, if you have put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, the scriptures teach that the spirit of God is born into you and you are a new creature in Christ. And the spirit of God guides you into all truth. He teaches you, helps you learn what the word of God says, but he also guides and directs you in the life that you ought to live. And part of the job of the Spirit of God is to use your moral conscience, your uh, mind, your will, and your emotions, and to direct you into obedience to God. And so going to the Lord in prayer is exactly one of the reasons why God has redeemed you, is to uh, given you the Spirit of God, is to help guide you through this act of dependence of praying to God. If it's on your mind... It's on God's heart. So don't be anxious. You may say that sounds good, but the reality is, chaplain, I don't really know how to pray. So can we talk about how you pray this morning? How do you pray? There's no rules to prayer, so to speak. Uh, God gives some guidance when you pray. You know, you are to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's the Lord's Prayer. And that can serve definitely as an outline for you to pray through. But scripture goes beyond that. It doesn't say that that is the sum total of what we ought to pray. It gives us other verses and other guidance on prayer. It says we are to pray without ceasing. It says that we are to cast all our cares upon him for he cares for us. He says that we are to confess our sins. There's multitudes of verses in the New Testament and in the Old Testament that give guidance on prayer. But I want you to understand this primarily that there is no hard and fast rules about prayer. When you pray to God, you don't have to pray in King James English. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, O God, hide not thyself from my supplication, right? I used to have a college professor that when he would ever pray, he'd speak to you normally, but if he prayed before class, the thys and the thous and the these would come out. And I think it was genuine. I'm not judging the guy. It's just what he did when he prayed, thy word, O Lord, you know. It would turn into that type of thing. You don't have to do that. I don't know if you've ever prayed with someone who feels like they're going to call down fire from heaven. Have you ever been in one of these prayer meetings before? There's no weapon formed against me shall ever prosper, you know. They're, they're quoting Bible verses here and there, and, you know, you're a little afraid about what's going to happen. I used to have this guy that uh, was a mentor to me named, named Charles Holmesher. He was an older gentleman. When I knew him, he was in his, he was in his 80s. And uh, he used to have me pray with him on a regular basis. He was over a ministry that I was a part of. And he would say, Danny boy, call me Danny boy. Danny boy, get in here and pray with me. He'd grab me by the back of the neck and he'd make me kneel down. And we'd pray. And this guy would pray and pray. If you think I preach long, you're having a hard time staying awake. Try staying awake with an 80-year-old man that prays for like an hour straight, you know. And I'm like, oh, no. And then, and then he'd get done. He'd elbow me because he was an old Navy guy, a tough dude. He'd be like, pray, you know. And then you'd start praying, and it would just go on and on. And he'd pray and pray. And it was kind of intimidating. When it was time to pray with Brother Holmshire, I was a little bit afraid about it because he was such a prayer warrior. Then I had an interaction with a close friend of mine by the name of Mike. Mike was an intern at church at the time, and I was just a high schooler. He was in college working at our church for the summer. And Mike picked me up, and he's kind of a, a, a spiritual mentor to me through the years. Uh, he picked me up. We were putting together some basketball tournament at our church. But before it started, he said, let's go get some lunch or some dinner. I can't remember what meal we were eating, but we went to Subway. We picked up sandwiches. We were driving back. And he said, oh, we, we need to pray for the food. So as he's driving, he's eating the sub sandwich. And Mike is a big Hawaiian dude, a big Hawaiian dude. So you have this picture of this guy in this truck driving down this road. And he's eating the sandwich and praying at the same time. And he says, Jesus, I thank you for this soft, warm bread. 
and the delicious mayonnaise that is spread so perfectly all over the meat and the tomatoes that are so crisp. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is the oddest prayer I've ever had in my life. And I'm trying not to laugh. But then I start realizing, you know what? He's just praying about the normal stuff of life. He wasn't trying to be irreverent or make me laugh. He was being genuine and real. And he was doing what? He was just praying. And here's the deal. Whether you pray high and mighty with King James, uh, King James English, whether you're calling down fire from heaven and rebuking the devil, or whether you're just praying about the meat and tomatoes on your sandwich, it doesn't matter. In the midst of anxiety, just learn to pray. Just pray. The verses say to present your requests to God. You know, the Bible's written in Greek. We translate it into the different ang- languages across the world. You could translate it within English, let your needs be known. Let your needs be known. You know, hey, God, I'm going through this. He wants to see that act of dependence. He knows what you're going through, but he wants to see you display dependence upon him. I think of my kids. Uh, if you have kids, how many of us have kids in here this morning? I'm kind of curious. Oh, okay, we got a few parents in here this morning, all right? Our kids communicate to us differently, don't they? Each one of them differently about their needs. I got two little girls, that's all I have. Um, my youngest daughter just straight up tells me what she wants. She's a six-year-old, and she has told me over and over again, Daddy, when you come home, can we go bowling? She's a bowling six-year-old. That's odd, but that's, a ta- that's what she loves to do. And so every time I talk to her on the phone... Daddy, when you come home, can we go bowling, please? Don't forget, you said we would go bowling. She's a straight talker, straight shooter. She doesn't try to manipulate me. She doesn't try anything. She just says, um, and I know it's coming. Once she goes, um, Daddy, can we go bowling? My other daughter, she's a deal maker. Oh, man, she's a manipulator. She's a little bit, uh, she kind of sets the stage, right? If she wanted to go to McDonald's, she's not going to say, Daddy, can we go to McDonald's? She'll say, Daddy, have I been a good girl today? I say, yeah, you've been a good girl. Daddy, did I get my schoolwork done quickly today? Didn't I? Yes, you did. Daddy, I bet you don't feel like cleaning up the house, do you? No. What do you want, Jail? What do you want? Daddy, can we go to O McDonald's? Because they call O McDonald's. I don't know why. Uh, Can we go to O McDonald's? Yes, we could go to O McDonald's. You know, they have different ways that they ask. But it doesn't matter how they ask. In the end, I just love that they ask. And when it comes to God, you can ask him right outright. You can sing your prayers to him. You can journal your prayers to him. You can sigh your prayers to him. You can shout your prayers to him. You can whisper your prayers to him. You can shout in anger or in excitement. I can encourage you and tell you this, that God is big enough to handle your small problems. And he wants to hear about them. They may be small compared to his power, but they are not trivial compared to his love that he has for you. I'm a loving father. I don't mind when my kids come to me with needs. In fact, I love to hear their needs. And I will tell you a thousand times more, God is never annoyed or put off by what you're going through. God wants your dependence. God loves to hear your requests. God loves to see you relying upon him in the midst of your anxious moment. So if you're anxious in your life, it's a signal alerting you to pray. Think of Peter, the way he describes his uh, need for prayer. It kind of shows our need for uh, what we ought to do when we're anxious. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7, this was our scripture reading. Very short, very sweet. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, right? Anxiety will eat you up. Worry can eat you up if you dwell on it. I like that he starts off in verse 6. He says to humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. If you are in a midst of a battle, really the, be, the, 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 the starting point of the battle begins with you humbling yourselves. 
If you're anxious, you need to humble yourself and pray. If I have to get something done, the most important thing I can do is pray, not work harder. We don't think that way, do we? See, if we feel overwhelmed by life, oftentimes what we simply try to do is just work harder instead of resting in God and praying. If we approach life by saying, I got a problem, God, I don't need you, I don't need to humble myself, I don't need to pray, I just need to work harder, I need to fix my own issues, then where you will find yourself at the end of that road is you will feel down, depleted, hopeless, and you will feel like Peter did as he was sinking in the water, right? Peter's a guy in the New Testament that miraculously stepped out of the boat and walked on water towards Jesus. You know, as the story goes, he took his eyes off of God and he started to look at the waves crashing around to him. And what began to happen? He began to sink in the water. Humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God that he may lift you up in due season. You know, when you look at the problems around you and you simply try to swim harder and fight against the, the current of life, you will find yourself sinking. What was the thing that saved Peter? What did he have to do in the story? Do you remember? He had to what? Lift up his hand. Help. Snatch me out of this water. In the midst of your anxiety, you don't need to swim harder, my friend. You need to simply lift up for help. That's where it begins for the believer. Submit. Give up. I can't do this. I can't make it out of this storm on my own. I need to rely on Christ in Christ alone. Admit that you're sinking. Admit that the problem is not necessarily the sinking, but the problem is your own proud heart that you're continually fighting to have control. See, what we do oftentimes is we don't respond with prayer, we respond with worry, don't we? We don't respond with prayer, we default to a worry, anxious spirit and heart. And we get into what is called, what I call the cycle of anxiety, right? We feel anxious about something. Uh, whatever the situation may be. Oh, no, you know, my daughter has crooked teeth. I'm going to have to pay for braces. Uh, if I don't pay for braces, she's going to drop out of school because she'll be mocked by everyone. And then one day I'm going to see her homeless on the side of the road. And I'm going to think, oh, my goodness, my child's a loser because I didn't buy the bracelet. You know, whatever the stupid path that we go down. We get anxious about something. We think about it over and over again. And as we do that, we try to take control of the situation. Okay, I don't have money for braces. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work an extra job. A second job, a third job, a fourth job, whatever it's going to do, I'm going to take care of the situation. And if we don't feel like we're getting hold of the situation, then what we try to do is we just fight harder and harder to get more control of the situation. Because we think we're going to lose control of what we already have just a little bit of control of. And as we feel ourselves losing control of that, we become more anxious. And so what do we do? We just fight for more control, which just produces more anxiety. And it just goes around and around. We battle for control. We feel ourselves losing control. We fight harder for control. We get more anxiety. My friend, you need to break that cycle in your life. Because you need to realize you do not always have the power to control situations in your life, but you always have power to surrender to God in your life. You cannot control how every little thing works out. We, can't, we cannot control the world stage, what's going on uh, in the world stage, right? That's beyond our control. But we can get on our knees and we can surrender to God and say, Thy will, not my will, just like Jesus did in the garden. And we can submit ourselves to Him. And we can pray. That's how you break the cycle. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may lift you up, that he may pull you out of the waves in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. 
No, cast means to throw, to release, to give, and to surrender. What most of us do with our problems is we throw them at Jesus' feet for about five nanoseconds. We say, here, Jesus, help me with this. Oh, too slow, Jesus. And we grab it right back. I encourage you not to do that. My question for you this morning is what is weighing you down? What is burdening you? What are you fighting for to get control of? Is it your future? Is it your job? Is it your finances? Is it your marriage? Is it this tour? Is it, is it your children? Is it what others think about you? Is it your parents' health? Is it your health? Is it the fact that you can't keep up in life? What is causing you anxiety? I encourage you this morning, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Cast your cares upon him and allow him to lift you up. At this time, we're going to pray and prepare our hearts for communion this morning as we observe communion on the first Sunday of every month. It'll be part of our response time with the Lord. I'm going to read a few things uh, and then um, uh, Ms. Chapman will come down. She'll hold uh, the bread. I'll hold the cup and you'll have an opportunity to come forward and partake if you wish. Uh, the exterior ring, the outer ring is juice. The interior ring is actual wine. So depending on what you like to observe when you take communion, you can choose from those two. The scriptures say this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 6 through 29. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it. All you, this is my body, this is my blood of the covenant that is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You know, during this time, I like to read this, I invite you to come, not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because of any goodness of your own, it gives you the right to come, but because you need mercy and help from God. Come because you love the Lord a little, but would, lo would love to love him more. And come because Jesus loved you and he gave himself for you. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive the bread and the cup, I pray that you will steal our hearts and minds that we will cast our cares and our fears upon, uh, upon you and let the bread and cup be to you a token and a pledge of the grace of Jesus Christ in our lives and the love of God. And may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit dwell among us as we receive these elements by simple faith. We ask these things in Christ's name. You will take the elements and then return to your seat and we'll receive together. I invite you to come forward at this time to receive the elements.
while they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks and broke it and said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup and said, this is my blood, which is given in the covenant for you. Do this in remembrance of me, in remembrance of him. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your body broken for us and your blood spilt for our sins. We pray that we will live in the light and the truth of that gospel and remember your grace was not cheap. Our forgiveness was not easy. Lord, help us to remember, Lord, that you are not far from our needs, our greatest needs, that you left the glories of heaven to live amongst us, to die on that cross for our sins. The story does not end there. You were buried and you rose again. And one day, we will gather as the church of God and we will celebrate in a meal together and look forward to that day. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together and in response, we'll sing our final song and we'll have a benediction and our dismissal. Stand with us if you would.
peace of God guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. May we cast our fears, our anxieties, and our sins at the feet of Christ. And may he lift us up as we humble ourselves under his mighty hand. We ask all these things in the name of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessings on you. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning.